evening has been dedicated and sponsored by a few people and dedicated in honor and memory of their loved ones. And I'd like to dedicate, make the dedication now. Uh, Moselle Friedman, A.B. Isaac, Diana Zilka, Moshe Ambachi, uh, Yosef Sadiq, Elias Howard, A.B. Bethel, Robert Sassoon, and Sally Nassim. And it's in memory of Yosef Ben Mazli, Mikhail Shmuel Ben Habiba, Ezra, Ben Elisha Zilka, Kohen, Munir Ben Amumai, Yehezkel Ben Khatun, Howard Ben Dina, Saeed Ben Amam, Sim Habat Khatun, Nisim Ben Abraham Nisim. May this shiur and the blessings that we make next door be an elevation of their soul. Amen. Tonight is a very interesting and riveting shiur. It is one of the most difficult topics that every human being and every rabbi grapples with. And that is end-of-life halachic dilemmas. One of the things that causes sleepless nights to relatives, to loved ones and to rabbis is how to deal with people who are at the last stage of their lives and um, there are different quandaries and issues, what to do, feeding tubes, breathing apparatus, turning off machinery, these type of things. So if we can ask everybody to please switch off their breathing and <laughs> apparatus, uh, phone machines, be good. But one thing I do want to tell you, being in hospital many a times and sitting with the doctors and the family, for obvious reasons, the doctors many, many times, too often, argue that when a person has reached their end of life stage, they do not support prolonging their lives, unfortunately. This is against halakha, in most cases. And unfortunately, the argument that they make is, is that what type of um, quality of life are they having? And um, is this what they would have wanted? And uh, they are in pain, etc. And quite often I ask the doctors, how do you know? How can you measure their pain? And they don't know how to answer. Subsequent to that, I read a phenomenal book. And anybody who's going through these difficulties should read it. It is called Dying Well. It is by a palliative professor who has um, many years of research, and he wrote two very powerful and interesting things that I want to share with you tonight. One thing is, is that nobody should die with pain. And if they are experiencing pain, there are two things. Either the doctors don't care, or they do not know how to treat the pain properly. That's what he writes. He's a palliative care uh, professional, and he categorically states that nobody should have to go through pain. There are ways how to treat pain today in in unprecedented manner. That's number one. So therefore the concept of pain and the guilt that we, so to speak, may feel by doctors placing that upon us, we should no longer feel that. That's A. B, he writes that one of the greatest things, he calls it dying well because there are those who don't die well. There are those who don't take the opportunity when they pass away to forgive past grievances, to make amends with relatives and friends, to come to terms with, 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 with the situation at hand, to be at peace with, one, with oneself and with others. And very importantly, to allow the greatest gift that one can ever give, he writes, and that is that although people love their own dignity and their own independence. But to give someone else, a loved one, the opportunity to care for you, he writes in the book and he says that this is what he experienced with his own father, that when his father led him the gift of taking care of him, that was the greatest gift that you could ever give. When a person submits to a loved one, submits their own independence, and so to speak, their own dignity he says there's nothing undignified about dying. It's part of life. <laughs> nothing undignified. We all have to learn that. It's part of the cycle of life. We come into this world, we are cared for. When we leave this world, we are cared for. And there is no greater kindness than a person allowing us, the relatives, the friends, to give that care, to give that love. And that has been such a powerful element 
in healing and showing love from one to the other, giving the love and receiving the love. And he writes that this is the most powerful things that he has ever seen. And it is unfortunate that the um, sterile medical field is uh, not looking at the whole picture and not allowing people to experience that wonderful experience. So this is one of the main topics that Rabbi Ullman will speak about, as well as organ donations. Any donation is difficult. For some people, any donation is like giving an organ. Um, so I'm sure organ donation is very difficult. <laughs> but I'd like to introduce to you a very important rabbi in Sydney. He's my colleague and my friend for many years and my study partner for many, many years. And he is a senior member of the Sydney Beth Din. Now, I knew the work of the Beth Din for many years, but until I joined the Beth Din, I had no idea the amount of work, the amount of service, and the amount of kindness that the Sydney Beth Din does to people, solves so many problems, helps so many people in so many ways, gratis, for no, no, uh, no benefit whatsoever. They do this voluntarily. And one of those that spearheads and, um, and gives the most of his time to Sydney Beth Din is my dear colleague and senior member of the Beth Din, Rabbi Ullman, who is also um, the senior rabbi of the Russian community. Please welcome him. Uh, he's a man of great knowledge and great uh, a wealth of experience. And it is a pleasure and privilege to welcome you tonight. Firstly, before I begin, I think it's my first opportunity to say what I'm going to say after my friend of Ashriki joined the Beth Din, speaking to the Sephardi community in the Sephardi synagogue. Since Rabbi Shriki has joined the Beth Din, he, which was almost, I think, already a year ago, if I'm mistaken. Feels like 10, but yeah. <laughs> he made a tremendous contribution already in the short time that he's been with us. And I want to extend on behalf of the Beth Din our appreciation to the Sephardic community that you've allowed him to share his great talents and abilities with the whole of the city community by joining us at the city of Beth Din. Thank you to Rabbi Shriki and thank to you. How long do you have, Rabbi Shriki? 45 minutes. 46 and a half. <laughs> you know, one time, there was a, uh, a Jewish businessman and uh, he had a non-Jewish business partner who was very interested and curious to attend a synagogue service. Thank you. And he asked his friends, next time you go to the synagogue, can I come along? I said, sure you can, no problem. So, but I have one request to ask you. It's the first time I'm coming to a very strange foreign place. Can you please explain to me the meaning of everything that is going on? It's a short, no problem. So he comes with him to the synagogue, and they sit next to each other, and he sees people get up, and sit down, and stand up. He says, what does that mean? So he explains to him. They come to open the ark. He says, what does that mean? And he explains to him what it means. Take out the scroll. He says, what does that mean? And, he, and the Jewish partner explains to him what it means. Until they came to the part before the Musaf service, when the rabbi comes to the podium, and he's about to give his sermon, and he takes off his wristwatch and puts it next to him. And non Jewish partner says, What does that mean? And the Jewish partner says, This means absolutely nothing, he says. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so uh, we're about to come to a very, um, a very, very deep topic in Jewish law. One of the most responsible and complicated because they involve human life. And we know that any scientific lecture is something that is very relevant to people in this world today. He said one time there was a, a Jewish old age home and they used to get different lectures to come once in a while to give lectures on different topics. So one time a scientist came along and he started to talk about how there's a, this 
global heating that changes the world. And he said that in um, four billion years, the position between the Earth and the Sun will be such that the Sun will melt everything and the whole solar system will disintegrate. And this Jewish guy called Mr. Cohen, he becomes very agitated and he starts to shout and he says, listen, we have to do something about it. Let's raise some money together. Let's make a committee. So the scientist tells him, sir, he says, why are you so upset? We're talking about four billion years. So Mr. Cohen says, phew, I got scared for a minute. I thought you said three million years, he says. As Rabbi Shriki mentioned, the topic tonight is the issues of end of life and also organ donations. And I think I'll start with that because it's a, today it's a very, very topical issue that is being discussed all around the world. Today, even just two days ago, there was a breakthrough um, scientific uh, innovation where they're able to transplant a uterus. A woman who couldn't carry a child, they were able to take a uterus from somebody else and give that uterus to the woman. It's the first time in history, just a couple of days ago. And this question bothers the Jewish community very much. There is a perception that organ donation is forbidden uh, in principle. Because organ donations requires one to defile one's body. So I'd like to address for a, a little while this topic. And we'll talk about two types of donations. One type of donation is from a living person to a living person. And the other one which requires a person to be dead. The first type of donation is, we, we hear about when a person, for example, uh, he has a kidney failure. And the only way that he can continue to live, because he has a limited amount of time, he can be on di dialysis. So the only way that you can live is if you get a donation of a matching kidney. There's something called HLA, which is a matching tissue, which allows the tissue not to reject the uh, organ which is implanted. And if you find such a person, you can live. Because God has created us in such a way that many things we have in pairs. One of them is kidneys. God has given us two kidneys, and a person can live with one. The other one is almost like a, uh, just a, a bit of insurance, a spare. And if one goes away, the one kicks in. So if we find a, a person who unfortunately has kidney failure, which means both kidneys can't function, he is, he is living on borrowed time. He can't live for too long on that. Dialysis is a limited solution. So the only way such a person can survive, if he will find a family member usually, because most of the time it's a family member can match, but it's not limited to family member. It could be anybody else who's matching H HLA. And uh, the question is, is it permitted? So in order to give you a consensus, there's a lot of discussion over here, whether or not a person can, is allowed to put himself in danger to serve another, to save another person. And then there's a discussion whether or not it's a mitzvah, whether it's a good deed, or is it a chiv, an obligation. But the consensus of, of poskim, of Allahic authorities today, that indeed it's a mitzvah, it's a good deed, and something very, very praiseworthy to be able to save another person by giving of one kidney. And we hear recently, today, that the media, the world is very small. We hear what's happening in all different parts of the world. And we hear within the Jewish community that the acts of bravery and noble acts of people who sometimes give a kidney to a total stranger. Many times we, you know, when a Jewish person is dying from kidney failure, they announce it on the, on the Jewish media outlets, on websites, and people who never met this person come along and they say, I'd like to be tested. And they give the kidney and allow the person to, uh, to, to live and create a tremendous bond between two people. Because the person who is a recipient feels in, in eternal debt to the person who's given him his life, at least to life. And uh, there's no question, with everything said and done about defiling a body, there's nothing greater than to save a, 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 another life. And the same thing applies to, to certain other donations, such as skin donation, which is after death, but it doesn't require the person, 
the, you know, it's quite simple in Jewish law. If a person dies and he's able to donate some of his skin in order to save people from very high degree burns, for example, or his eyes, it's still something, you know, soon scientists will find a way how to be able to make synthetic eyes. But today it's still very, very relevant. The answer is that if one can save another person, it supersedes the law of the transgression of defiling a body. And indeed in Israel they have uh, skin banks where they have, they have a certain statistics, how much they will need a year, and they <coughs> ask for donations from people to be able to give some of the you know, skin grafting, to, to be able to do skin grafting later on. And once they fill the quota, they leave it alone, and then they replenish it again. And again, the POSCA discussed it, POSCA means Allah authorities, and the consensus is that even though we're very much concerned about any kind of defilement of the dead body even after death, and that's why cremation is forbidden, and utmost respect is given to a dead body. If you, if you look at the laws in the Hebrew condition, how, what to do with the body after 120 years, as we say, when a person passes away, the amount of care that goes into respecting the body and giving it dignity it's something which is truly, truly tremendous. But again, it's considered also to be even the greater mitzvah to be able to give life to another human being, a quality of life to another human being. The question comes up, and this question became very relevant in recent times, what about those parts of the body that require a person still for those parts of the body to function? In other words, heart, liver, if a person dies in the conventional sense of the word and all parts of his body die, it's impossible to donate your heart to another person. And as much as we believe that human life is intrinsically, almost intrinsically <coughs> sacred, when I say almost because the, as we know from the Talmud that as much as we treasure human life, there are three laws that supersede human life. Everything else, life comes first. When a person, God forbid, is sick on Shabbat, not only it's permitted, it's an obligation to break Shabbat to save a human life, even when a person is in a possible danger. If a person is dying of starvation, and the only thing which can save him is non-kosher meat, a person is obligated to have non-kosher meat. But the chai bohem, the Torah says, you have to live by the laws, not die by the laws. However, there are three laws that supersede even life. And these laws, they include idolatry, which means it's the ultimate uh, betrayal of our religion when we serve other gods. In that case, we are told that a person is to give up the life, a Jew is to give up his life or her life, and not worship other gods. Certain laws of forbidden intimacy, like adultery and incest, over there also we are told that a person must die rather than transgress those laws. And murder, take another life. If somebody comes to us and says, you know what? We'll kill you unless you will kill another person. Hashem says, who says that your life is more precious than the other person's? What gives you the right to kill another person? Self-defense is different. Self-defense is something that we, if somebody attacks us, not only we're allowed to defend ourselves, we're allowed to even make preemptive attacks to, to, to save ourselves. It says that, the famous quote, that when somebody comes to kill you, you, have to, you can preempt it and kill him first. This was the basis for the preemptive attack of the, of the state of Israel with the Six Day War. If you learn about the history of the Six Day War, Israel attacked because they knew that there was a threat of annihilation from all of the Arab states around them. And they didn't wait to be attacked. And they attacked first. And, was, and that's why there was a minimal amount of sacrifices in the Sixth War, as opposed to Yom Kippur War, when the Israel didn't want to attack first, and there was so many needless lives taken away from us because of the lack of preemptive attack. And that's why in Jewish law, self-defense is something else. We're talking about now murder. When they bring an innocent person, and they say, you know, we'll kill you unless you kill an innocent person. We'll have to die rather than kill an innocent person. So we see that over here, we come up with a very interesting question. In order for a person to donate the heart, for example. The condition is, no matter how much you try to save 
the person who needs the donation, the potential recipients, there's no justification in Jewish law to kill another person. Not just justification, there's no permissibility. We cannot take one life in order to save another life. It's forbidden. And it's irrelevant in our books, as Rabbi Shuki mentioned, that today it's very popular to talk about the quality of life. Jewish law does not believe in that particular concept. We believe in improving quality of life when we can, but it doesn't mean when there's a perceived lack of quality, life becomes redundant, and life becomes um, unnecessary to be disposed of, God forbid. Other cultures had it. If you study by the Eskimo culture, they used to believe that when it comes to, to the age of 80, they would take the elderly, they would put them on a sled, they would get, and send them away to the death. Because they believe what's the point? They're not needed anymore. And there is the danger of all of these philosophies connected with euthanasia about killing people because of quality of life. That's something which is very foreign to Judaism. It's called retzif, it's called murder. There's no justification for it. And therefore, one of the reasons why there's a perception in the Jewish community that it's forbidden to be an, a, an organ donor, such as giving one, one's liver and one's heart, because unless we know for sure that a person is dead, we cannot kill him to give his heart. If by taking his heart we're killing him, that's murder, and that doesn't justify even in order to save another life. That's very, very important to understand the Judaism. Life is holy, it's important, but you cannot save a life by taking away another life. And until recently, the question of the moment of death was, in Judaism, was quite simple until the second part of the 20th century. Basically, when a person was dead, which means his whole body discontinued its function, the heart wasn't beating, the breath, there was no breathing, he was considered dead and then he was buried. How did you, in olden times, how did they test when a person was dead? They would take a feather. This was in all countries, both in, in Eastern Europe, in Western Europe, in, in the North Africa, in Israel. All of that, until recent times, the way they would check a person whether he's alive or not, they would put a feather to his nostrils. If the feather wasn't moving, then he was declared dead after a while. And it was irreversible cessation of any kind of life, and he was still buried. That was quite simple. It's interesting that in, uh, in Europe, in 1772, there was a Duke of Mecklenburg who started to talk about, he wanted to introduce a new law, and he actually introduced it in many of the Western European countries. And he said that, you know what, he said that we have a problem. In those times, it became a very, very common problem. The doctors would declare a person dead and would bury a person only to discover that he's alive. And uh, he wanted to create a new law that they want to keep a body unburied for three days. And when they see the body is decomposing, which is a sign of death, only then they could bury it. The problem was so great that anybody heard the expression, saved by the bell, I'll tell you where it came from. It came from those times. What happened was they were so scared to bury people alive, they would bury them with a bell inside, going, you know, going a rope inside, with a bell outside, and a person, if he happened to wake up from his coma, he would pull the rope, and the bell would save him, because they would know that he's alive and they would undig the grave. And that was the, the, what the expression saved by the bell came from there. At that time, the rabbi started to discuss uh, this particular problem, and all the rabbis, first in 1772, at the time there was the great Yavetz, Yaakov Emden, who came out with a, a long letter saying that it's, this particular um, innovation is totally foreign to Jewish law. The Jewish law tells us exactly when a person is dead, and once it reaches a certain point, it's irreversible, and you have to bury the person immediately, and by keeping the, the body uh, unburied for longer than one day, it's considered, considered to be halonat hamet, which is a great prohibition of leaving a uh, body unburied. Till today we know that we'll try to do it as soon as possible. And 60 years later, it looks like the, the, this particular law, even many Jewish doctors, and even many of the reform rabbis, there was one rabbi who was the founder of the Askalab movement, his name was Rabbi Moshe Mendelssohn, he defended the particular custom and he was fighting to institute it among the Jewish people. He said, yeah, we should leave a body unburied for three days. But all of the rabbis came, came out against it. In, the 70, in 1837, 
The famous Khatam Sofer, the great European rabbi, he wrote a long response explaining what is considered to be death. He gave three signs, which I'll talk about, it's very relevant to our discussion today. He gave three signs of how you can tell a person is dead. And he said, he concluded that for us, it's absolutely forbidden to follow the rule of the Duke of Mecklenburg and to keep a body uh, unburied for three days. And he gave, the signs that he has given was basically the things like the, the, the beating of the heart, the breathing, and comatose uh, state of, of the body. So these three signs were for him a sign of irreversible cessation of life. Now, until the second part of the 19th, of the 20th century, the question of point of death, whether it's the brain or the heart, was quite irrelevant because these things came almost hand in hand, almost simultaneously. It never happened that a person's brain ceased to, to, to function and the heart continued to function for a period of time. It was a matter of minutes between the two. Only in the second part of the 20th century, when they, when they discovered, when they started to innovate things like respirators and put people on on, uh, on um, synthetic breathing machines, even though they didn't have their own natural breathing, their own spontaneous breathing ability, that they put them on machine, what, what they call today, a ventilator or respirator, only then it became possible for one to be dead and for the other one to be alive, for the brain to be dead and for the heart to continue to beat. And then the question came up, what is considered to be the moment of death? And it's became very relevant to us, why? Because that today is, first of all, it's a question of end of life issues where you can actually turn off the machine. If a person is already dead, there's no point keeping on the machine. But if a person's alive, you're obligated to do it. The second question is um, if all the nations, if we're talking about brain death, then it's possible to give your heart and your liver to somebody else. If we're talking about heart criteria, it's impossible because by the time the heart will cease to function, it's already become redundant. It's impossible to give one's heart to another person. The ramifications and the implications of the question are very great. If a person is alive, you're obligated to desecrate the Shabbos. You're obligated to do everything possible to continue to keep him alive. If a person is a coin, the coin can be in the same room with him and doesn't have to leave the room. If a person is dead, then to continue to deal with the body, is desecrating Shabbos. You know, you know, once a person's dead, there's no point in to, to break the, you're actually breaking the Shabbos and there's no saving life issue over here. Because one is permitted to break Shabbos to save a life, but not when a person is dead. When a person is dead and you keep him, keep him unburied, you're actually committing a crime, a transgression of ventilating a, a corpse, a body. And a coin, of course, is to leave the room if the body is dead. So there's a lot of halachic implications to decide when a person is alive and, is, and, and when, a, when a person is dead. What, what actually constitutes the criteria of death. And over here I'm going to make it quite short because it's a very, very involved topic. We talk about it for not just for hours in one lecture, but it could be a whole course, many of lectures. So I'm going to give you a little synopsis of the issues involved. Two main schools of thought appeared in Jewish law among the great halachic decisors. Because there are really three ways I can define that a person is alive or dead. One way is the brain criteria. The second one is the heart criteria. And the third one, which is not accepted in any school of Jewish law, that's when every cell becomes dead. But that's already, it could take weeks. We know that when a person is dead, his nails, his hair continues to grow for a long time. If you're going to wait for that to, to cease, then we're going to hold different criteria with nobody in, among Jewish halachic authorities agrees with that criteria. So we're not discussing here when every cell in the body dies. We're talking over here either brain or Heart. And over here we have, like I said before, two main schools of thought. The heart, some rabbis they talk about the heart. We have great rabbis such as Rabbi Vozna who just passed away. He was a great proponent of the heart. Rabbi Eliashiv, he spoke about the heart. And then you have other ones like Rabbi Badi Yosef, uh, Rabbi Mordechai Leo, they were towards the brain criteria. The question, as anything in Jewish law, it's not decided by a whim or particular sort of where the heart or a particular decisive lies. It goes back to how you understand the law, the way it comes out from the Talmud and the codes. And the source of this particular law, apart from the fact that we have interesting sukim with different verses, for example, it says, that Hashem breathed into Adam the soul of life. 
So I think that there are many, many uh, verses in actual Tanakh that talk about the idea of the nostrils, the idea of the breathing. But in the Talmud itself, there is right at the end of the tractate of Masech to Yuma, which talks about laws of Yom Kippur. Right at the end, it's already like two, two pages before the end of the whole tractate. It's 85, page 85. Over there, they're discussing when a, uh, the, when a person is buried by a wall of stones, a building collapses, and you have to break the holy day of Yom Kippur or Shabbat in order to save a life, even, a possible, even when a person is possibly alive. Until you, there's a slight possibility that a person may be alive, you're obligated to break Shabbat. And the Gemara, the Talmud discusses how do you find when a person is alive? And it tells you that you have to go all the way up to, up to his nostrils. And then, if there's no life over there, then you cease. I'm simplifying it. There's a lot, a lot in it. But I'm giving you just the source of the Gemara. And on the basis of this Gemara, there are many of the earlier and later commentators who discuss this particular question. Like I said before, it wasn't as relevant in olden times as later on. But... I'm going to concentrate more on the modern day scholars of our generation, how they took to it. So, we have, I'm sure most people here heard of about the great rabbi of the 20th century called Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, who was uh, an American, he was a, a East European rabbi, came to Russia in 1935. He became a, a great, great halachic authority who, there wasn't any question in modern Jewish life which he didn't touch upon. Anything from modern medical questions, uh, questions of, um, uh, of uh, monetary laws that apply to the modern times. There wasn't a subject in, 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 this, uh, in our life of the 20th century, passed away in, in 1986. Actually, passed away right now, that was his, his uh, Askara. There was passing, he passed away on uh, Eve of Purim. But since, since uh, he passed away on a not a leap year, so it was the 13th of Adar, so June, just now, just, just now passed. So he, there was a very big question about his opinion. It wasn't clear. If you look, for the, he, there was an American rabbi, he was more of a doctor, a rabbi, he wasn't a great halachic authority, but he popularized. There were a lot of books about medicine and halacha. His name was Rabbi Bleich. He maintained very, very strongly that Rabbi Feinstein believed in the heart criteria. That while your heart is alive, it's impossible to give any organ donations and a person is alive. And I must say, with all due respect, that I don't agree with that. And I agree with the family of Rabbi Feinstein, who was his both sons and his son-in-law, who maintained that Rabbi Moshe Feinstein did not hold on the heart criteria. I'll explain to you why. Rabbi Feinstein wrote a, a response a legal thesis in 1967 or 68, where he spoke about the first, very, very first heart transplant, which was done in South Africa by a doctor called Christian Bernard. And Christian Bernard would know that he, um, both the recipient and the donor died. And the Feinstein called it a double retzicha, double murder. Based on this response, Rabbi Black says, well, Rabbi Feinstein must believe that it's the heart, because he, because he obviously is against heart transplants. But if you look a little bit deeper in what Rabbi Feinstein is talking about, he's talking about this particular case. In this particular case, there's no question that it was a double murder, for two reasons. Reason number one, he killed the donor. He took a young woman who was alive, probably, later on they made investigations. She was alive according to all criteria, both according to brain criteria and according to heart criteria. By the way, the brain criteria means that the brain has to be dead completely, including the brain stem. Brain stem is the part which controls the breathing, spontaneous breathing of a person. A person should breathe on his own. That comes from the stem of the brain. So if the stem of the brain is alive, the person is alive according to halakha, according to Jewish law, according to Harvard criteria, this person is alive. And to be able to take the heart at the time is truly murder. Today they wouldn't allow it in Australian clinics. At the same time, he has killed the recipient because 
that they weren't able to find the HLA to be able to find the right anti-rejection medicine to be able to the body should reject the tissue. And both the donor and the recipient died. So it doesn't mean that Rabbi Feinstein, he said that it's wrong in principle to be a, a donor. What he was saying is that in this particular instance, it was a ritzicha, it was a murder on both ends. You weren't allowed to do this thing. Towards the end of his life, he wrote a response, and he clearly told his, his sons, who, who he's continued his uh, path of, of uh, guiding the Jewish people and Jewish law and so on and so forth, he told them that in Europe, we know that the way that, that it was decided who's alive and who's dead is by putting a feather next to the nose. That was the most sophisticated way to know it. Which means it's good with breathing. So whatever controls the breathing, that's the criteria for, for death. And that is the reason why, in my humble opinion, again, I'm not here to, both opinions, they are upheld by great rabbis on both sides. So I'm not coming here and, and uh, being uh, presumptuous enough to come along saying that I'm arguing with the great rabbis who hold the opposite opinion. But I'm here to, to give you my humble opinion based on my study and based on, on, on talking to, to a lot of different scholars on both sides, and I'll give you my opinion, and obviously a person can choose whatever he wants, and a person should ask his rabbi, and, uh, uh, and, and later I will tell you that the, the uh, system we devised with the city of Din had to allow uh, people who wish to follow the, the brain criteria to be able to sometimes even be halachic donors. But basically what, what Rabbi Feinstein was saying is that whatever controls the breathing, that is the criteria. Today we know that it is the brain and the brain stem which controls spontaneous breathing, respiratory system. It's not the heart. The heart is an independent organ that, that continue to, um, to, to uh, contract and to the muscle of the heart and continue to operate even when a person is decapitated, when you cut off the head. For a while, not for too long, but for a while it can continue. Because we know that the Total cessation of the brain activity, including the stem, it's equivalent to decapitation. That's exactly what happened. When a person decapitated, it's an irreversible cessation of breathing. In other words, you can't bring it back. And that's what happens when the brain is completely ceases to, to function. So what the Rabbi Shafashta basically is saying is without actually using the word brain or heart, he's saying that it is definitely, according to his opinion, it is the respiratory function that makes a difference between a person being alive or a person being dead. That was the opinion of Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. And, th and this is also the uh, consensus as to his opinion by his son, Rabbi David Feinstein, who is considered to be the, 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 a, a prime, primary disciple of his father, Rabbi Ruben Feinstein, who is the, who is the uh, his younger son, and Rabbi Moshe Tendler, who is a son-in-law. Some people, they're a little bit distrustful of Rabbi Moshe Tendler because he was also a doctor, and they feel as a doctor he may have an agenda. I'm not saying he did, but I'm just saying some people have this position. But certainly, Rabbi Feinstein's sons, they have a, there's a tremendous trust in their opinion and in their understanding of what the father believed, and that is, uh, today, most people who understand Rabbi, Rabbi Feinstein's opinion, they agree that that's what he held. Another great scholar in in Israel, who passed away in 1995, was Rabbi Oyerbach, Rabbi Shlomo Zaman Oyerbach. And he was very interesting because he had one problem. He discussed the matter with many doctors. And he had one particular problem with the brain criteria. And his problem was that the Talmud says in a tractate called Erechid that if a pregnant mother dies, her the fetus must die before that. That's the rule that the Talmud gives. And the doctors in, in the end of the 20th century started to say that it's possible to be able to be brain deaf and nevertheless to save a fetus. So he was saying this can be the criteria because the, the Talmud clearly says that if a person is properly dead, then the fetus must die. So he was discussing this with a, um, a doctor with whom, a, 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 one of the greatest experts in uh, Jewish halachic ethics, whose name is Rabbi Avrom Steinberg. The Sidney Beth brought him out about a, a year and a half ago, maybe even two years ago by now, to Sidney to be able to help us to do what I'm going to tell you, to, this, to create a system which we have created 
because we wanted him to, dis to discuss this with all the ICUs and hospices and different government bodies that are, deal with uh, the nations and so on and so forth. And uh, what happened was that he was very close to Rabbi Erbach. And he suggested to Rabbi Erbach that it could be that it's not a contradiction. It could be that today, because they're able to uh, have different machinery to control breathing in a synthetic way, to be able to bring out, even though there's no spontaneous breathing, maybe that's the reason that you can reconcile and still believe in the, in the brain criteria, despite the fact that today they can save the fetus. So Rabbi Oerbach, he devised an ingenious experiment, which was a historic experiment. He said, let's take a pregnant sheep and without causing any pain to it, Rabbi Shrika said a very important point, that today, there's no way that you can, if you want to, you can make sure that there's no pain. We know that on one hand, we're allowed to experiment on animals. We're permitted to do it because if it helps science, if it helps to be able to achieve our goals, we're allowed to experiment. But we have to minimize the pain. To make sure that there's no, because there is a law against Tsar Balichai cause pain to animals. So he asked doctors, are we able to do what I'm going to do without cause any pain to the animal, and he was told yes, to be able to do it. And he made the following experiment. It was done in 1992. Two pregnant sheep, and they actually decapitated the sheep. At the same time, they were uh, making sure to, to, to stop all the bleeding, and to make sure that it's totally uh, anesthetized, so there was no pain whatsoever, and to continue to put in oxygen and uh, respiration into, into it. And uh, the experiment lasted for many hours, and they were able to decapitate, and decapitation is according to all opinions. As a Mishnah, nitaz rasho mitameba oil. If a, there's a decapitation, it's automatically considered to be dead. So over here, there's no question that if you're able to sustain the life of the fetus, even though you decapitate the, the mother, then it's not a contradiction. The same thing could apply to brain death. Just, to, just as decapitation is for sure cessation of life, simply you could say that brain death is also cessation of life, but because of the modern techniques, you can't sustain the fetus. And lo and behold, it worked. It was it took many hours. I must tell you that this, the, 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 the child is still alive today. After, after all these years, 23 years, 24 years, the sheep is still alive today. And I don't know, at least uh, as far as last year, I haven't followed it last year, but uh, last, a year ago, we're still alive. And, um, and Rabbi Oyerbach, he really changed his psak after that. He did not, he, he completely reversed the, the tone of, of how he spoke about the nations, how he spoke about the uh, end of life issues as far as brain versus heart is concerned. In Israel, the uh, chief rabbinate, uh, starting from Rabbi Mordechai Leo and Rabbi Shapiro, took on the position uh, of brain criteria, and they've devised over the years protocols and different um, um, rules of how to be able to deal with all the nations, including end of life issues. And they did it together with uh, Rabbi Zalman de Chemde Goldberg, who's one of the greatest. <coughs> authorities in Jewish law, and as far as the doctors are concerned, they had a group of two or three doctors. One of them was Professor Steinberg, and one of them was called Professor Halper. Both were involved in the sheep decapitation experiment. They worked together with them how to be able to bring in the, those uh, protocols into the uh, hospices and hospitals and so on and so forth. And this was actually uh, legislated in 2008. Here in Sydney, we decided to do a similar protocol a similar system. Basically what it means is that even though in theory if somebody takes on the brain death the, the brain criteria as cessation of life, so if the death of brain and the, the, the stem, the brain stem means that a person is dead, then the question is can you not implement organ donations such as heart and liver? And the answer is in theory, in principle, yes, but in practice it's not so simple. Because we know that ultimately we have, if a rabbi is responsible to a family that is coming to with a question, the rabbi has to be completely certain from his side, not just relying on doctors. Because unfortunately, sometimes doctors have an agenda, sometimes. I must tell you that I was very pleasantly surprised when I started to, to go into meetings with doctors. In Australia, the system is quite good. 
they realize that the only way they can achieve it by separating the two domains, which not, not conflict of interest. So the, the, the doctor which decides whether the person is alive or dead, he cannot be the one to decide about donations. It has to be two separate departments, because otherwise it becomes a bit of a conflict of interest. If a doctor wants to achieve a donation, maybe he has a bit of an agenda to be, say the person is dead, you understand? But in Australia it's pretty well formulated and pretty well established how to separate the two departments. Nevertheless, we have a rule in Judaism that ultimately when it comes to a rabbi taking responsibility, we cannot trust doctors in the full sense of the word. And I work with it and doctors are very understanding. Some of you may, may have heard the way we established a system 20 years ago here in Sydney, which pioneered throughout the whole world, of how to do halachic uh, fertility treatments, such as IVF, which allows uh, couples, Jewish couples, who wanted to do it according to halacha, to do it without compromising anything from Jewish law. And we have a system, and here in Sydney, we work with all the clinics, how to be able to have independent <coughs> supervision, that everything is supervised independently from the hospital, and then we can give a complete assurance to a couple that everything was done about what everything is done without any question. And the same thing over here, what we did was we trained ourselves in supervising um, halachic death according to the brain criteria. It's for those who want to choose the brain criteria as the criteria. The reality is that in Sydney, the hospitals may not allow many times to choose the heart criteria because legally they're able to, once the person is dead according to the, uh, to the civil law, then they will disconnect with or without permission many times. And they need a bed for somebody else, stuff like that. But at least those who wish to follow the brain criteria, which is accepted by the chief remnant of Israel, today also Rav Amar, Rav uh, Yitzhak Yosef, they all accepted the brain criteria as the criteria. So if somebody wishes to accept that, we provide an independent supervision. And this assures the family that somebody who is on their side, so to speak, watching over them and giving them advice without any pressure from the hospitals. I'm going to give you a, a short illustration, a story that happened recently. Uh, somebody in, um, actually somebody that we share in our community, both uh, my community and Rabbi Shuki's community, there was a, a lady who I got a call on Thursday afternoon that she suffered an aneurysm, which means like a vessel burst in the brain, and she was rushed to the hospital. I spoke to the family on Friday, and she was kept in the respirator. After Shabbat, the minute I made Havdalah, I'm getting phone calls from the family, please come to the hospital. I rushed over to the hospital, and there's a huge fight going on between the family, and it's quite a large family, and the staff. And the staff tells me we don't know what to do. The, 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 the woman passed on, and we're telling the family that they can come and say goodbye, we're return of the, the machines, the respirator, and the family telling us we are murderers, and we are killing and so on and so forth. And uh, I understood the family. The family is concerned. They, they don't, you know, when it comes to a, a, a person close to them, they don't want to be in a position to trust anybody. They want to be assured that uh, everything's fine. So I told the family, would you allow me to look into it? And if I will tell you, so whatever, Rabbi, if you will tell us, we'll accept it. So I asked the family to leave the room, and I told the doctors, I'd like you to perform the following tests in front of me. I asked them to five clinical tests, and, and one was called confirmatory test in front of me. And the doctor was quite surprised. The rabbi is, understands you know, how to be able to, to observe and how to be able to tell, uh, to read those tests. But they've carried those tests in front of me. And um, uh, afterwards I came to the family and I said, indeed, your mother, your sister, your grandmother has passed away. You come and say goodbye. And the doctors are now able to turn the machines and the family accepted it and were very, very grateful that now they felt comfortable that, that they not got to be doing it too early. But that's the advantage of having these systems. It's not as much as, uh, and I must tell you that, you know, when, when we allow uh, the Jewish people in theory to be um, donors, in reality, it happens very rarely, in reality. It creates a Kiddush Hashem, because the perception in many communities is the Jews are allowed to be recipients. They're allowed to accept uh, uh, organs from other people, but they can't give. So to take from somebody else, that's fine. But to give yourself, you can't give. And that's not a very good perception of us. 
That's to take to, that we're not worried about maybe we're taking somebody else's life, but he's alive, that, that's okay, as long as I'm, I'm alive. But to give you can't. So the idea itself that the rabbis permit under certain, albert under certain very specific conditions, to do that, that created a tremendous amount of Kiddush Hashem was reported in the news, and it created a very, very good name for the Jewish people. In reality, it never happened yet, I must tell you. It didn't, we weren't able to, and thank God, I don't wish it should happen to anybody, and nobody should have to do it, so I pray and hope that all of this will remain in, in the realm of theory and not in the realm of practice. But where it did help a lot is in the realm of end-of-life issues which are coming to now. I'll try to how much I have. Five or six minutes. Okay, so I'll try to, to be as quick as possible. I want to be able to talk about it. Six minutes? Okay, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I might go a little bit over time, but uh, I'll try to do as fast as I can. Just for a moment, I think that uh, one thing that um, could be addressed, which is very important, is what happens when a person reaches the end of life. What are you committed yeah, to? Yeah, well, I'm coming to it. I'm coming to it right now. Yeah, I'm coming to it right now. And also, yes. sometimes the doctors say that they're going to be brain dead any minute now. I'm going to come to it. Exactly what I'm coming to it. So what I want to say is I'm going to give you a couple of illustrations, nothing like a real-life story to bring the point across. In Jewish law, we have to remember that when it comes to end of life, people are called terminally ill or elderly who have very little time left according to laws of nature. The Jewish law distinguishes between what's called heroic means and methods to sustain life, which I'm going to explain what it means, and the most uh, essential life sustenance. The difference is the essential life sustenance, sustenance means to give a person his oxygen, ability to breathe, hydration, liquid, water, food, if it's applicable, you see that not always it's applicable, and regular antibiotics. And this is called a regular sustaining of life. If we come along, and this is what happens unfortunately, as much as Australian law doesn't allow to terminate a life before its time in order to give a donation, organ donation, because that's considered over here a sort of unethical to be able to, so to speak, to even they understand that to terminate the life in order to be able to, to give another life doesn't seem right, even in their eyes. But what they do all the time is they want to be able to quicken the demise of the person when they perceive that it's imminent and in their eyes they say the person is suffering or is undignified, whatever one of the one they say, or there's no quality of life, they want to be able to quicken the demise Sometimes they have shortage of beds in ICUs and hospices, and this is absolutely forbidden in Jewish law. When you deny a person of these essentials, it's equivalent to killing the person. Why? Because it's not our business to be able to say that a person should live shorter because we perceive his life not being a life of quality. However, Judaism does say that not always are we obligated to administer what's called heroic treatments, which one example is CPR, which means to, to resuscitate, you know, by giving electric shocks and stuff like that. Then we say that there are two criteria, two simultaneous conditions that may tell us DNR. DNR means do not resuscitate. What are the two conditions? Condition number one is uh, when a person is in pain and the different opinions among like Rabbi Shuki mentioned, not always you know whether he's in pain or not, but there are criteria, halakhically, when a person's pain, when a person is conscious, he can articulate his pain to other people. And by the way, sometimes it is, very, it is difficult, even though usually we can control pain, but not always it's easy. Sometimes there are certain patients who do struggle with, with uh, pain control, and so on and so forth. And sometimes people suffer tremendous, not just physical pain, but suffering. People suffer physically from debilitation, and the lack of function, and if they, they, they go through physical suffering. When a person is going through physical suffering, that's one condition. And the second condition, that he's terminally ill, which means that if he will bring back to life only for a short time, then halachically, it's a consensus of almost all of the halachic decisors. Then you can say DNR, don't resuscitate, don't break the ribs, don't go into, don't go into, into things, even certain antibiotics, there's a difference between basic antibiotics, and when you go through different families and cousins and so you know, I don't know if you're familiar with antibiotics, sometimes you have to go into a lot of research to find how it, uh, you know, it affects a particular uh, disease, a particular bacteria. 
So you're only obligated to give generic antibiotics and the things I mentioned before, such as saturation, oxygen, and so on and so forth. That is a must. The other one, it depends. Sometimes the rabbi will say, no need for heroic action. I'm going to give you two illustrations how important it is to follow the Jewish criteria. One story was, this happened in October, it's literally more than two years ago the story happened. I received a phone call from a member of the, of the Sydney Jewish community who told me his father just suffered a stroke and he's in hospital. And the doctors want to turn off the machines. I rushed over to the hospital and I saw that it was a family which was basically intimidated by a team of four ICU uh, personnel. One of them was the head of the ICU, one of them was a social worker, and two others. And they were putting a lot of pressure to convince the family to turn off the machines. So when I came in, the family said, look, the rabbi is here, and he will tell us what's right according to Jewish law. So I asked to see the diagnosis. I looked at the diagnosis, I told the doctors, you know, only one hemisphere is affected. The person is alive according to all criteria. How can you justify terminating his life? So the doctor said that this person will remain without any communication, he will remain in a coma. He won't be able to communicate, he won't be able to speak. He will remain in a comatose uh, state. And therefore, it's more humane to just to turn it off and let him die. And, uh, and he's, he was arguing that maybe if you turn it off, he'll be able to breathe on his own. If you will leave it on, he'll live forever. I said, look, it doesn't work this way. But if, while he's alive, I, I don't want to contradict the doctors, but in reality, if he can't breathe on his own, the only way you're allowed to take him to the machines is only to win him off to see how he can manage. But as soon as he sees no managing, you're obligated to put him back on if uh, he's alive according to our criteria. And uh, the doctor said, we'll never put him back on. That's against our rules. Once you take him off the ventilator, you can't put him back on. So I said, look, in Jewish law, you must sustain him. You must give him his basics. So the doctor said to me, if it was my father, I would turn on the machine. So well, that's his father. And he has a right to decide what to do with his father. He said, if, if he could speak, he would ask us to turn on the machines. And again, I said, look, he can't speak, but I'm, I, I've known this person for many years, and I'm sure that he would want to do what's right according to Jewish law. They were very annoyed with me at the time. I could tell that they were very angry that this person came and interfered with them. But the family stood strong. Not always the family stands strong. I had cases when the family gave in to the doctors, but in this case, the family stood strong. And the interesting thing that happened was the person came back to life and lived for another two months. And in these two months, the family said that the present which they received in this two months is something which they can't quantify in any sense. Because it gave them what Rabbi Kshik spoke about closure. Such a sudden uh, you know, stroke that took the father away from them and they weren't able to communicate with them. If he would have died there and then, they would feel a certain void. They weren't able to tell him what they wanted to tell him. He wasn't able to tell him what he wanted to tell them. They spent two months together. They told him everything they wanted to tell him, how they feel about him. They expressed love and appreciation, everything he did for them. He spoke to them. When finally he passed away, there was certain peace from both sides. And the family said they were so grateful for that present that God gave them of those two months that it really, they, they, they can't even measure. It's like something which they really can't properly, adequately explain. And when it came to the Leviathan, to the funeral of that person, I spoke because I wanted people to hear about it and to learn from it. And I said, you know, because this family that was so faithful to do things according to Jewish law, they, were, they received a present, which they felt was a very tangible present, which they will keep for the rest of their life. There was one particular story that happened. Another story that happened was there was a very um, prominent barrister in Sydney, and I received a call from him. It was, I remember clearly because I was on the way to America for a conference. It was November uh, 2009. And he called me up and he said that his mother, elderly mother, is in hospice. And she is uh, terminally ill. She has cancer. She's suffering. And uh, she lost any desire to live. And he asked me what to do about it. So I said to him exactly what I told you just now. And I separated, I said, look, I'm, it's very difficult for me on, on, in, on the way to the airport to analyze, properly assess the situation. It is possible that in this condition, if it's truly terminally ill, if she, as you say, it's possible to say DNR and to ask not to administer any heroic treatments, but certainly the basic life sustenance, such as oxygen and hydration and so on and so forth, you have to give her. So he asked me an interesting question. He said to me, what if she doesn't want to take it? We understand that that's what the obligation of the family, of the hospital, to give it to her. 
What if she's refusing? She wants to die. So I said to him, well, we hear you a very interesting difference of opinion between Rabbi Feinstein and Rabbi Erbach, the two rabbis I discussed with you before. And Rabbi Feinstein says that as much as it is obligation on a family and on the people around to, to administer those life's sustaining techniques to keep that person alive, mm. but a person who refuses to do it, they're also obligated to do it.